Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. I'm Jenna Million, and this is a podcast where we discuss feminist issues in music and pop culture, all while empowering fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. We're back. It's Welcome 2024. to 2024. <laughs> Welcome to season four of the podcast. Oh my God. How crazy is that? <laughs> crazy. So crazy. But obviously you guys haven't had to miss us too much if you like our artist interviews because those have been going up on the feed and the most recent one with charlotte sands i think is up there with one of our faves yeah no she is an angel we stand charlotte we need all of you to go stand here too i think a lot of you guys already follow her on socials so maybe you are already listening to her music but if you don't know she's like a pop rock pop punk girly bringing in some of her 90s singer songwriter michelle branch vibes she's great she toured with five seconds of summer last year as well as the band camino and we just got to have like a really nice like open conversation with her it felt like she just Mm. like really got us and like the mission of what we were trying to do and like felt like we were able to really understand her and like we had a great conversation about her recent song blind Mm. spot about you know having feelings for someone who's telling you about their feelings for someone else as well as just like her experience with making music videos like it's just filled with so much great stuff on top of her also being a really big fan of like fans of five seconds of summer she's like a fan of fans and we love it so much i love that so much but also like in a similar theme to what we are getting into today in the episode we also talked about the like language of songwriting and like what that means and like song interpretation and stuff which i thought was just really interesting and i think she like put into words for the first time a lot of thoughts that like we have been having based off other interviews we have been doing yes we definitely want you to go listen listen to charlotte sands interview come chat with us if you have thoughts and feelings But also we got to do a fun little radio live discussion with two other podcasts in which we talk a lot about movies. And so I wanted to tell you guys about this because we don't always talk a lot about movies on our podcast and we actually Mm -hmm. did this time. So we did a live (laughs) show for Wizard Radio, which is the same radio station where we do our interviews. So we got to have this conversation alongside great pop culture debate and it's a fandom thing, both podcasts dealing with pop culture and fandom, as you can tell from the names. And it was just like a live discussion of like thoughts and feelings of what's going on in pop culture right now and we got to talk about saltburn obviously we kind (laughs) of talked about saltburn in a way that we hadn't talked about it before we talked about short kings we talked (laughs) about mean girls and willy wonka so honestly it was a pretty fun time yeah, I think it was a really cool conversation. So if you guys want to hear our conversation with It's a Fandom Thing, as well as Great Pop Culture Debate, that is available as a podcast on Doing the Thing. And we'll have that linked in our Instagram highlights if you want to go there and find the direct link so you can listen back to this. But it's a lot of fun movie-related jokes and nonsense going on. And like in our conversation, we also were talking about like 2024 pop culture predictions And now I feel like you guys know this, but like we are not trend forecasters in the slightest. That is not our forte. We are just girls with opinions. And so on our Patreon, we are going to be having a conversation that's like a little bit fangirl nonsense, a little bit educated guesses based off of like what we were seeing happening towards the end of 2023. And we're going to be doing like predictions of what we think are going to be like big moments in 2024 and like what we think is going to be trending in Hollywood and pop culture and all of that stuff. And I think it'll be cool to listen back to it when we do like our end of year episode at the end of 2024. So if you want to check that out along with like all of our past music mounts on episodes you can get that at patreon.com slash name three songs you can join for anything from one to ten dollars a month and so you can get all of that and more at patreon.com slash name three songs today we are talking a little bit about golden globes during our fangirl nonsense and then we are talking about billy eilish's variety red carpet moment there there was a kind of debacle about her coming out and not coming out we're getting into all of that we have an interview specifically with the journalist who went on to a podcast to share her side of the story and it's really interesting so we're going to be talking about that as well as an op-ed that came out in the new york times all about gaylor once again um it's the same journalist who wrote about harry styles possibly being queer for New York Times. So clearly this journalist has a thing for speculating about gay celebrities in the New York Times. There was a lot of backlash as far as, you know, people saying New York Times should have never published something like this. That's so speculative. 
about someone's sexuality. And we also talk about, you know, the weight it has as far as fans having these conversations and fans interpreting music the way they want to interpret music. So with all this, we will have timestamps on our Instagram stories and save to the highlights. And with all that, let's get into our fangirl nonsense. Sarah, would you like to take it away? Yeah, because I have the biggest ick about Timothy Chalamet. (laughs) (laughs) Not because... Love that this is fangirl nonsense now. Ick's Uh, also fangirl nonsense. Ick's are also fangirl nonsense. Ick of the week. I feel like having an ick about Timothy Chalamet is fangirl nonsense. Like, peak fangirl nonsense behavior. (laughs) I mean, okay, just to like... Put it out there. I've never gotten the Timothy Chalamet hype. I just like don't understand. I'm just like out of the the two like starving Victorian orphans that we can choose from. I would choose Tom Holland every day. Timothy Chalamet is not for me. But <laughs> at the Golden Globes, whoever was doing the like between behind the scenes video videography work, they were doing God's work that night because their two focuses were Taylor Swift and timothy and kylie because like timothy chalamet and kylie jenner like haven't really been that public with their relationship like they were at the u.s open they've been at like a couple concerts like we don't have a bunch of photos of them so this camera operator was doing so much work they deserve overtime pay for like what what they gave us keeping it bad <laughs> But, like, seeing Timmy and Kylie flirting, like, okay, they were so cute, it's nauseating. I honestly, like, I ship it. I ship it deeply. I'm here for it. Like, I'm pretty sure we talked with you guys about Timmy and Kylie before and about how Timothy is very much, like, a New York City theater. Yeah. Yeah. Lives downtown somewhere in New York City, causes problems, wants to date an IG baddie. Like, that's that's who Timothy is at his core. He's just, like, in art house films as well. So, like, they make sense. The thing that I got the ick from is that Timothy is so in love with Kylie Jenner that he forgot to clench his jaw (laughs) while being filmed from his profile. And I've never seen a sweatier looking sewer rat in my life. (laughs) There's some things we just don't need to see. Yeah, like, Timothy letting the world be aware that his jaw isn't as strong as we thought it was was, like, not it for me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i love that you're like the ick is not timmy and kylie the ick no. is timothy's side profile yes <laughs> he just like looked like a new york city rat after the rain like that's the best way to describe it like if you saw like if somebody photographed a really wet new york city rat like that's what timothy's side <laughs> profile looked like to me <laughs> But we did have like actual gossip. <laughs> like I feel like there is no there is no real gossip about them other than just like lip readers reading that like they were saying that they love each other and it was really gross. The real gossip is that Selena Gomez during one of the intermissions, Selena Gomez went over to Taylor's table to give some deep gossip because Taylor had her jaw open. The girl next to Taylor, who I don't know if any of us know who yeah, she it's, is. It's, uh, she it's, was it's Kelly Teller. It's Miles Teller's wife, who is like I guess oh, really? Taylor Swift's best friend of the moment. Interesting. Kelly Teller, she's the weak link. <laughs> <laughs> if we need if we need information, she's gonna break first. <laughs> Because she was laying it all out on the table. Like we could see everything from her. You could hear um, her. And so in the video footage, like you actually hear her be like, Timothy? And it's like, yeah. okay, girl, you don't yell his name out loud. <laughs> At an award show full of celebrities and also yeah. the general public watching yeah. the camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is she's not cut out for this, but <laughs> she did give us a nice treat because now everyone's trying to go read the lips of Selena and Taylor and Kelly Teller. So everyone is speculating that Selena says, I asked for a picture with him and she said no. And then they were like with Timothy and they were all nodding and like gasping. And Selena's like, yeah. And so everyone's saying like Selena went over to ask for a photo with Timothy Chalamet and Kylie Jenner said no. So this is a gossip that's running rampant around Twitter and also TikTok. It's interesting because like we talk a lot on the podcast where it's like we are telling you guys about people's opinions, the media's opinions on things, and then we're reacting to those opinions and the people putting those opinions out there. 
And so this is like another one of those interesting things where like there's part of me that's like just let the girlies gossip. And then there's the other part of me that like loves watching every single person on the internet dissect the moment or like come up with like their reasonings for like why Kylie would do that, like why Selena would do that and all of this. And like the one thing that I haven't seen in any of these articles is it's like we talked about the Hailey Bieber Selena Gomez feud for like weeks on the podcast at the start of 2023. And Kylie and Kendall are like BFFs with Hailey Bieber. So if anybody's going to have beef with Selena, it's going to be Hailey Bieber's like girl posse. Girl gang. Yeah. And so I just thought it was interesting that with all of the reporting on this, nobody was linking back to that because like people love to bring up old, old gossip and they're not doing it. Yeah. I do remember Kylie was involved with that TikTok drama of commenting and then posting and then deleting and yeah. yeah. But I just feel like if Selena had actually gone over there, like if this, if it was true, if she'd actually gone over there, I feel like we would have had video footage of that also happening. Yeah. Because the camera was always on them. Yeah. I mean, part of the discussion, I guess, is like how much of this is just like silly, funny, like entertainment for us and how much of it is like negative media speculation which like all of it really is just like internet speculation not even like the media is not speculating on it the media is reporting on the internet speculating on it yeah but i mean like the media is also like calling up professional lip readers (laughs) to see who can get the best lip reading first because they all need their own which i think is funny but i mean like the craziest thing out of all of this is again it's like We've talked before about the times in which like Harry Styles chooses to like or Harry Styles' team like chooses to give a statement where it's like we reach out to Harry's team and it's usually like no comment. And like the two times he has like his team has commented was Chris Pine Spitgate and then him being uh, rumored to be in White Lotus. And we had a People article like a People exclusive (laughs) where like they specifically said a Gomez source So, like, this is serious. Like, it wasn't even just, like, a source close to the celebrity. It's, like, a Gomez source (laughs) told people that they were not gossip, that they were unequivocally not gossiping about Timothy Chalamet and Kylie Jenner. And they're, like, quote, she was absolutely not referencing anything about Timothy or Kylie. And they said that Gomez never spoke or saw them. (laughs) Which, like, okay. I feel like the saw is, like, going a little bit... They were in the same place. I just feel like that's like a little bit like, okay, we we get it. Was that so? Be fucking for real. (laughs) It's just funny because I feel like Selena is always a person to like try to set the record straight for like her point of view when it's like sometimes it's just not worth doing because the internet is going to be the internet. Her latest thing was talking about people being mean about the fact that she's dating Benny Blanco, which like who cares good to get good good for them like sound the big video but i guess people were being mean to her about that and then this of just selena's being like i was not gossiping i was not gossiping about kylie jenner i also understand because it's like maybe she's doing it preemptively because of the fact that all those stories with like Hailey bieber and kylie yeah. being involved with it happened before and she doesn't want anything to spiral out i know that you and i have become too close of friends because my automatic thought was well what's her star sign and what does it mean <laughs> according to the she's internet a cancer. she's a cancer sun leo rising aries moon does that help you, did you look it up it's, yes i looked it up oh my so i was right she's a cancer yeah. <laughs> sun <laughs> wait say it again cancer sun leo rising aries moon would this have anything to do with this behavior <laughs> I mean, cancers, like, being very, like, water signs, very vulnerable, really hate being in the center of speculation, so I can see why she's trying to shut it down, because this type of stuff affects her deeply. And then Leo rising, being her pride, like, she's very prideful in the way she presents herself, so... I love how my like first thought was like, it must be her astrology. And you're like, it is her astrology. I mean, Aries moon also being a fire sign and not being ruler of her emotions. I don't know. I think she wanted to stamp it out before anything happened. Like I said, but that's me on my very base level knowledge of astrology. (laughs) I love how I just knew she was a cancer. That's wild. (laughs) In other news, there was like a lot of crazy things that happened at this Golden Globes and like Ao Berry and Jeremy Allen White like taking the cake for like a new bestie couple that we should all ship. I will be posting a roundup of just like silly little tweets that we saw about Golden Globes on our Instagram if you want to go enjoy. 
But we do also need to talk about the Jeremy Allen White Calvin Klein campaign and like the weird way in which this spilled over into the Golden Globes. I know because like this is one of those things where immediately I'm like this is fangirl nonsense because of the way that everybody is reacting unabashedly. So on Canal Street and Broadway in New York City, there's these two massive billboards and Calvin Klein has gotten them for the Jeremy Allen White thing. The amount of TikToks I've seen and I've seen like so many of these just like people basically like doing a pilgrimage to go look at these massive billboards of jeremy allen white in downtown manhattan which i, I mean think is, as you should that's what they're yeah, for exactly <laughs> exactly and so like this is prime like fangirl nonsense if, for also for context if you like don't know what we're talking about again i'll post a video on our instagram but like this man is like first of all obviously he was training for like iron claws so he's like be, been in the process of becoming very fit and I'm sure he like was bulk. I was I was explaining to Sarah what bulking and cutting is, but I think that he was bulking a lot for Iron Claw, and then for Calvin Klein, he was cutting, basically meaning that you amass a large amount of muscle and also fat, and then when you cut, you slim down all the fat, so the muscle is revealed. Liam Payne famously, like Liam Payne talked about this when he did his Hugo Boss campaign yeah. about like the diet he went on specifically for that campaign. So I think Jeremy Allen White is the same thing. Man is straight up like stripping on video, like. I don't think we've had a Calvin Klein campaign with somebody being like this buff in like a while. Yeah. Because even like Jungkook's campaign was like way more tame than this. This is like full on like I'm here to be a sexy man on a giant billboard. Yeah, because I feel like the like more recent Calvin campaigns have been like, I feel like this in my Calvins. Like it's like feeling like yourself. And now they've gone back into like the sexy man thing. I saw a tweet, I think it was, about how like we did a 180 of we realized objectifying women was bad so we started objectifying men instead and like that's kind of that kind of feels like (laughs) what we're doing but like from the female gaze because this calvin klein ad like especially the video was very like this is for the girls therefore this is not icky in any way (laughs) well also i mean like whenever we talk to dr thomas bodinet for our episode on like k-pop and sexualization Mm -hmm. He was talking about like with K-pop idols, like having sex appeal is literally part of the job. And like for this campaign and the way that this campaign was shot and like Jeremy Allen White agreeing to do this campaign, that was very much a part of it was the sex appeal. Yeah. So it's like in this regard, it's like it's not even necessarily like unwarranted objectification. It's literally like that's what the whole whole purpose of the ad was. No, 100 percent. 100 percent. It's just interesting and funny because it's like the objectification is supposed to be for the consumer and for the fans. And but because of and like we talked about this before, like we did a whole podcast episode about how like TikTok and social media has like changed media and like the shifting landscape of like how the Internet is reacting to stuff changes how the media writes about stuff. And so in that regard, it feels like the media has gotten so used to reacting and writing things based off of how people are reacting and posting things that they like have forgotten that like they're professionals at work because like this ad came out so close to the Golden Globes that it was like the focus of like one too many red carpet interviewers asking every single person who's ever spent more than 10 seconds with Jeremy Allen White their thoughts and feelings about the close-up photos of his abs. Yeah, I mean, to the point where Ayo Edabiri was like making it very known that she was uncomfortable. And I don't know what video it was or like what media outlet it was that one where there was like a bunch of people all standing in a room together and the guy pulls out tv or something yeah the host like pulls out this like giant like poster like size print of one of the jeremy allen white pictures in his underwear and like in front of jeremy allen white and ao adabiri among with other people and was like now we need to talk about this and then like he's kind of like laughing and like Oh, uh, haha. And then Ao Deberry runs over and she like puts it, oh, she like puts it down, like facing the wall. And the guy, the host is like, What are you doing? And she was like, We don't need to look at that. Like, we don't, we don't need to do that. And she's like, That's my boy. That's my boy. I gotta look out for him. A point that she made literally in another interview, somebody also asked her about yeah. it. And she was like, That's my coworker. <laughs> like, stop. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one thing. Like, when she was on the red carpet, they were interviewing her and Quinta Bronson together. 
And like Quinto was also clearly uncomfortable with the fact that they brought it up. And I was just like, I'm at work. <laughs> like, yeah. like, what are you yeah. what are you talking so, about? I mean, like my thoughts on this is that I feel like it's a combination of like both like YouTube media publications doing things for like that are a lot more clicky. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like even the like wired, like most search yeah. interviews are kind mm-hmm. of like the same thing or like the thirst tweets, like reading thirst tweets. It's yeah. like where interviews that are set up for celebrities to react to internet conversations yeah and a red carpet is not the place to do that a red carpet is to be asking them about like the movies that they're literally nominated for and going to represent because they've achieved a very high level of expertise within their career yeah and so then watering it down to like internet clickability just feels really gross because it's like when they go to like wired or buzzfeed or variety and like they know what interview they're going to be doing like they're prepped on it before they get there they are like are agreeing to be objectified when they go into that room or whatever the case is whereas like on the red carpet there's an assumption of like what red carpet interviews are going to be like and i feel like that assumption can no longer be an assumption over the past couple of years now that we just have like tiktokers running wild on the red carpet like I was, like, so uncomfortable because I was seeing a lot of videos of, like, TikTokers, like, on the red carpet or, like, afterwards, just, like, going up to these celebrities who were, like, supposed to be... Because, like, the Golden Globes especially are kind of, like, the one where they, like, get a little bit drunk, like, let their hair down, like, just have fun with their friends. Does it feel like a place TikTokers should be? I saw one video of this like one girl like Willem Dafoe is like walking past her and she's like oh my god like I just have to say something to you and he like stops and she like grabs his hand or something and she like does an impression of him from Spider-Man and he was like clearly so fucking uncomfortable and it's like girl you're not like you're there to be a professional like this is so weird but like back to the Jeremy Allen White of it all it's like it's crazy to me that like the most professional interviews that I saw on that red carpet were done by that guy and like who has recess therapy on TikTok where he interviews small children about their <laughs> thoughts and feelings. And it was him and two small children interviewing the celebrities. And they were the most professional people on that whole carpet. And like the celebrities were like so happy to see these kids. And like the kids were so excited. And they were just like, I don't, it was like very wholesome. And like, meanwhile, legitimate legacy publications are there with like the Jacob Alordi bathwater yeah, scented candle. That was also fucking weird. Like yeah, asking weird. celebrities to smell it and ask them what they think it smells like. And it's yeah. like, you do know that you're handing them a candle that is insinuating Jacob Alordi came in it, right? Like what? We had talked about recently how like red carpet interviews like feel very like weird and off. Yeah. And like the hosts aren't really doing a good job anymore. And it's just, like, uncomfortable for everyone involved. And it feels... I feel like maybe, like, legacy publications are in this weird space of trying to figure out how to, like, stay relevant when, like, everything these days is just, like, such, like, clickable content. But meanwhile, Um, all fans want is good journalism. (laughs) Like, I just feel like fans constantly... Like, I feel like every fan's favorite writer is a younger millennial or older Gen Z journalist who grew up being like, why are they objectifying and sexualizing and not caring about things that are happening with my favorite celebrity? And now these people are journalists and asking good questions. And meanwhile, we have non-journalists or like super veteran journalists on these red carpets. So it's like the TikTokers being TikTokers and then these older people trying to keep up with the TikTokers. And it's like, the, no, nobody wants this. <laughs> like yeah, nobody wants yeah. this content. <laughs> So in all of this conversation of red carpets, we also have a similar, like just a weird situation that happened with Billie Eilish at the Variety Hitmakers event. And this happened a while ago. This was on December 2nd, but we were on break for the podcast. So we didn't get a chance to talk about this. And since this has happened, the journalists involved in this situation with Billie Eilish went on a podcast to tell her side of the story. So we do have more information to discuss. But essentially, this was regarding the interview with Billie Eilish and Variety, in which she did a cover story that came out in November And Billie Eilish made remarks in the cover story vaguely, roughly regarding her sexuality in which she said, I've never really felt like I could relate to girls very well. I love them so much. I love them as people. I'm attracted to them as people. I'm attracted to them for real. I have deep connections with women in my life, the friends in my life, the family in my life. 
I'm physically attracted to them, but I'm also so intimidated by them and their beauty and their presence. So when this story came out online, essentially there was a lot of like positive reassurance, people supporting Billie, like other media publications writing like, oh, did Billie Eilish like come out? Like, did Billie Eilish just like talk about her sexuality without talking about her sexuality? There's a lot of women supporting her as well as people in the LGBTQ community. And so this happened in November. Fast forward to the Variety Hitmakers event in December and the same journalist Tiana De Nicola, who worked on like the Variety cover story as well as a video, was also the reporter for the red carpet event for Variety. She asked Billy basically like, you know, how did you feel that you had so much support coming from women after you said this? And Billy was like really shy and awkward and was like, I'm like nervous, but I still think women are pretty, but they make me nervous. And then the journalist goes on to be like, Billy, like, did you mean to come out? And then Billy just kind of word vomits and says a lot of things and was like, I mean, I thought people knew, but yeah, I guess like, I guess I kind of came out. And then like a day later, Billy goes on Instagram and posts, I can't believe Variety outed me at like 10 a.m. on a red carpet. Yeah. And so then there was this big backlash of like, Billy, what the fuck? Like also like no, like using outed is like a very strong term that has yeah. like a lot of very like dangerous connotations for people who are not celebrities. And also like the scenario in which has happened to Billy, like wasn't really even an outing. And so Billy then got a lot of backlash, both for kind of going back on her words, but also kind of throwing around the term outed. Because again it's like the assumption based off of the variety article from a lot of people was oh billy admitted that she's attracted to women therefore she's come out in some extent so like her then saying that like oh variety confirming this that i did say this on a red carpet is outing me like I don't, everybody was kind of like what like that doesn't make any sense but because of that, there was also from another corner of the internet, there was like backlash towards this interviewer of her of this behavior because they're just like, right. okay, like I'm taking Billy at her word, like this is how she feels. Therefore, this journalist is now enemy number one. So Shannon Beveridge has a podcast called Gayer Than Ever with Shannon Beveridge. And so she asked Tiana to come on the podcast and talk about the situation. And so they had like a really long discussion about like Tiana's experience what she felt like happened, like her version of the story, basically. And so my like big takeaway from this is that Tiana talked about how the reason why she felt like it was okay to be like, Billy, like, did you mean to come out? Was because during the, for the Variety cover story, they also did a video interview in which Tiana did a 40 minute interview with Billy, spent like an extended amount of time with her and made it clear to Billy, like, I, I'm a queer journalist, like, you're safe here, and, like, trying to make Billy feel comfortable, like, having whatever conversation Billy wanted to have. And I think that, like, as, as a journalist who has interviewed countless, like, musicians throughout my life, I've had multiple situations where, like, an interview that I've done has, like, resonated deeply with me personally. And I feel a deep connection with the artist. And I assume that that artist also resonated deeply with that interview and had the same visceral reaction to spending time with me and having the conversation with me as I did. Forgetting that, like, these people do interviews like this all of the time and, like, have big lives and, like, I'm just a small person to them. And then get upset when I see them again months later and they don't know who I am. <laughs> Like, this has happened to me, like, multiple times in my life. And so I'm assuming that this happens to other journalists, too. And there have been times where I've gone into situations where I'm interviewing an artist again months later for, like, some other reason. And I'm like, oh, like, we already have a rapport. And then I go into it and I'm like, this person does not know who I am. And it, like, right. and it, like ruins my day. And so, like, my assumption is, is that... Tiana went into this red carpet interview being like, I had this beautiful conversation with Billie Eilish. I told her about myself and my background and my and like my focus on like caring about queer stories because I'm a queer journalist. And then on the carpet, we were just continuing that conversation we had had months ago. Again, this is like right. my assumption, again, based off of like what she was saying in this interview with Shannon. And it doesn't seem like based off of Billy's reaction that like Billy still had that background information about Tiana like loaded in her brain. Yeah, 
Yeah. I watched the interview, like the red carpet interview back multiple times. And I was like, it feels so weird on both of their parts. Yeah. Like it feels like both of them came to the interview with assumptions about what this was. And neither of them expected this to happen because also I think if you're a celebrity who's doing a red carpet event, also this was like a breakfast like morning event. Yeah. I don't think you're going to the red carpet being like, we're talking about my sexuality today. Like, that's not what you're there for. Like, (laughs) for a hit maker's event. Yeah. It's like what we said about the Jeremy Allen White Calvin Klein ad and like the carpet at the Golden Globes. Like these people are coming to the Golden Globes carpet expecting to be asked about like the thing they were nominated for. And instead they're being asked about how good Jeremy Allen White's like ass looks in his tidy whities And it's like Billie Eilish shows up to a red carpet and is like, okay, this is what I usually expect from a red carpet interview. And this reporter shows up and she's like, oh, I'm going to get to talk to Billy again. We had such a beautiful conversation last time. I'm just going to pick up where we left off. I agree. I think the journalists did some assuming as far as assuming they were picking up where they left off, assuming that because it was said journalist, it automatically meant it was a safe space to talk about queerness. And I think like... I understand where the journalist is coming from, and I appreciate her background of wanting to create safe, comfortable spaces for celebrities to talk about this stuff. Yeah. But again, I think at a time and place, and this was not it, as I just kind of described it earlier, it felt like Billie Eilish was like word vomiting because she didn't know what to say. And honestly, I think Billie Eilish usually does this. Like she always just seems uncomfortable in general. Yeah. And the journalist was very much like, I would never want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. But again, I think they were both just coming to the conversation with very different assumptions. And I think also just because you tell someone hey, I'm a queer person. Hey, like this type of storytelling is important to me. Like I really want this to be a comfortable environment. Just because you set that context, that doesn't mean that the celebrity is going to feel comfortable and going to want to have that conversation. And I think the way that Billy has very much dodged the whole thing of talking around how she really feels is not her coming to have a comfortable conversation about queerness. Yeah, it's like her testing the waters of like what she's comfortable with letting people know and like in this interview tiana she said that billy willingly like brought up this idea and she said like the whole i think women are pretty but i'm scared of them and i think also like just in conversations that i've had with like out queer friends i've said similar things to this before and they're like oh it's because you're bisexual and i'm like i don't know if that's true and so i think like the queer mindset of like this thought is like oh like when i was like figuring out my sexuality i was like oh women are pretty but i'm scared of them and that was just because i had like crushes on them and it's like right okay but also like billy grew up in the limelight she grew up with like this certain thing and it's like it was still kind of like the era of girl against girl a little bit when billy started so like the fear of girls not liking her is completely normal it just feels like the journalist was ready for billy to be further along in the conversation than billy was ready to be yeah and so i think like when so like to your point in that regard the journalist is like oh billy's saying that that means queer in some regard and billy is like is it does it like i don't know i haven't really gotten there yet in her own personal journey and i think then when the journalist followed up and was like Billy, did you accident? Did you mean to come out in that story? I think to Billy, coming out was like a really big phrase that she was not expecting or wanting to necessarily like admit to. Yeah, because Tiana went on to say like, so I thought, oh, okay, this is a, the conversation we're having. We're going there because Billy said. I think women are pretty, but I'm scared of them. And so then Tiana goes on to say, so I kind of asked about the comments made in that story and she was very open about it. It felt like just a beautiful queer conversation. And she continues on. And again, this goes back to the assumption I made earlier of, she says, I had asserted that I was queer as well, which I think she may have already known from our previous conversations. And she was like, you know, in that video that we had done, I was kind of left feeling that, oh, that was like a really positive conversation for the community. And then as soon as she expressed she was nervous, I changed the subject. But it's like, you let her waffle. I don't know. I just feel like if you want to have like a safe queer conversation, you see somebody like flailing for a life vest, throw them the life vest, give them the out because like you've been in that situation before. But again, it's like, I think that there's just, it very clearly is like, there was a huge misunderstanding happening. Yeah, again, I think it all comes down to like time and place. And like, I totally understand where she was coming from and like her intentions. Like I think her intentions were good, but I think looking at everything now, 
there was just, again, there was just a misunderstanding on both sides. I mean, I think Billie Eilish's kind of like retraction to all of this and saying she was out, it also was kind of like an overstep. Yeah. So I don't think it was bad. I mean, I appreciate that the journalists went on this podcast to like talk about it. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have had that additional context. And like, I appreciate, you know, what she's trying to do and her yeah. being so honest about it. So, I mean, I think it gave us like more insight into the whole thing of what actually happened. Yeah. I guess it's like the big issue in all of this is it's like going online and being like somebody outed me in public. It just feels like Billy doesn't know what that means or like the weight of it because outing somebody is like something that like celebrities used to get like blackmailed. Like I'm going to out you if you don't like give me this money. I mean, even Tiana and like Shannon Beveridge were talking about their own personal stories of coming out. Yeah. And Shannon Beveridge shared that like, she was like a preteen and she was at like a female friend's house and they were just like hanging out in the bedroom or whatever. And basically there was like a baby monitor in the room. And so the parents of the friend overheard their conversations and basically called Shannon's parents and like forcibly outed Shannon to her parents when she was a teenager, still figuring out like what everything meant to her. And of course this is, you know, at a time also, as we've talked about where like being queer isn't as acceptable as it is in this very moment. And so she was talking about her experience being like extremely traumatic of being outed. And I think a lot of queer people for a long time live in fear of what coming out does mean. And with Billie Eilish growing up in the limelight, sometimes it feels like she says things that don't have a lot of context to them. She did say what she said in that Variety interview and like her team allowed it to be published. It's just like with Shannon's story, like in mind, it's like, imagine your parents being told something before you even really know what that means. Publicly on the record. Like Sabrina Carpenter talked to the same journalist and the journalist mentioned the whole like Pope thing with like the Feather music video. And Sabrina's like, I'm not going to talk about that and just left. And so it's like, it's like you do have the option to like not have the conversation. I know that that's like not who Billy is, but also like Billy should be media trained enough to like not waffle in the way that she did. I don't think anybody's like wrong in this situation. I just think that it's like an interesting thing to like continue the conversation of because the journalist gave more context to the story and knowing that she went into it again kind of like from this mindset of like oh we've talked about this before like she knows my backstory whatever like i don't know it feels more relatable to understand the like quote unquote mistake of like kind of giggling with somebody that you think you already have a connection with and being like, did you just come like, did you mean to do this? I mean, I think the bigger conversation here is celebrity sexualities, which, oh boy, do we have a (laughs) big story for you guys today because we have another op-ed in the New York times about Taylor Swift. So one of our lovely listeners, flower moon 77 on Instagram, they messaged us saying that they remember that we had talked about this crazy op-ed about Harry Styles sexuality that the same New York times op-ed writer Anna Marks wrote in 2022. And they were like, this woman wrote one also about Taylor Swift. I thought you should know about this. And I was like, wow, I'm going to go kill myself. Thank you so much for sending this to me. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Because if you guys want to go back and listen to, again, it's that same like TikTok affecting the media episode. So like you don't have that much homework to do today in regards to going to back episodes to know (laughs) our thoughts and feelings on things. But we did have a deep conversation about Harry and compared to Taylor Swift, Harry is somebody who has without saying he's bisexual said he's bisexual like i'm gonna keep going back to the better homes and gardens interview where it's like the people who need to know know and i'm like so the people you're having sex with know who you're gonna have sex with like i'm so happy for you um, but taylor swift publicly especially right now is very much coming off as like very 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 straight i keep joking with anybody who will listen to me that taylor swift right now is very much giving like that christian girl autumn meme like everything about her, (laughs) which I think is very funny. But this op-ed is like another op-ed about Gaylor and Taylor and her Easter eggs and the queer iconography that Taylor uses in her songwriting and like her whole life, basically. And there are parts of the story where I understand where this writer is coming from. And there are parts of the story where I'm just like, the amount of stretching you are doing right now would pop your arms out of your sockets. So this piece is kind of interesting because like it's 
like a 5,000 word piece. It's very long. So like the first part is pointing out all of the like LGBTQ related things Taylor has done both as an ally and in like iconography as well as that 2019 interview that Taylor did with Vogue in which she said, I didn't realize until recently that I could advocate for a community that I'm not a part of referring to the LGBTQ community, all this within her lover era and the music video for you need to calm down. And so the journalist is like setting up a lot of context of like laying the landscape of here's all the potentially queer things Taylor has done, said, even though she said specifically she wasn't queer, but here's still the things that like point to her actually maybe being queer. So it's like half of the article is like maybe Taylor is gay. And then the other half of the article is something that I agree a lot more with which is basically talking about like interpretation. And I think Sarah and I both agree that like art is meant to be interpreted in different ways by different people, depending on who you are and what you bring to the art. And so like, if you are someone who is queer, who can read queer iconography, who can read queer messaging into Taylor's work, That's your interpretation of it. Yeah. And that's valid. And that helps move culture forward. That helps with representation. That helps you feel seen and safe. There's a lot of valid reasons in being able to discuss this idea of Gaylor online. But I think there's a difference between being able to read something into the art and then also like forcing an image onto the artists themselves. Yeah. I mean, like in our interview series, we've been having this conversation with multiple different artists in regards to like lyricism and like fan interpretation of lyricism and like how the artist will write a song about one thing and fans will find meaning in whatever they find meaning in. And it's kind of like writing a song is like a language of its own. And like you as a listener are going to translate that into your language. And I think it's just one of those things where even in reading this article, like so much of like the queer iconography that this writer is claiming Taylor utilizes in her music is such like deep queer lore, like deep queer history that you have to know about it to understand that that's what it is. Whereas like a lot of this stuff that they talk about are things that I can also understand a straight person not knowing that it's queer and just putting it into music because it's like clearly there is a whole huge section of Taylor's fans who aren't Gaylers who don't believe in this who see like deep meaningful meaning in Taylor's music and lyricism and relate to it in their straight way you know and so it's like it can't be that unequivocally gay if also straight people are relating to it but again it's because like everybody interprets things in the way that their brains are wired and like jenna said i think like that's the beautiful thing about art is like it's accessible to anyone and everyone and unless an artist is like out here unequivocally being like my music's not for the gays like keep your gay thoughts away from my music which like there are artists who do shit like that, like then the music can be for anyone and it's open for interpretation. Like Taylor isn't out here saying like, don't interpret my songs to be for you because she would never do that. But at the same time, she is unequivocally telling people to mind their fucking business. (laughs) Like that is like Taylor's whole thing is like telling people to like leave her alone and stop spe- making speculations about her. But then you see Gaylers be like, yeah, stop making speculations about her being straight. And it's like, she is like the manliest man boyfriend right now. <laughs> I don't know. Like I was clicking on all of the links in this article and like the amount of times where she's like, oh, like rainbow this, rainbow that. I'm like, I do not see all of Roy G. Biv in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the girl is just wearing bright colors. Like we are yeah. reaching. <laughs> Yeah. So I feel like the larger conversation here is more so that the New York Times, one of like the largest and most respected publications in Western media, is allowing journalists. I mean, they've been under fire for allowing journalists to publish some really kind of egregious op eds in the past few yeah. years. But this is the second time that this specific journalist, Anna Marks, has published an article with New York Times speculating about the sexuality first of Harry Styles and then of Taylor Swift. And to me, like this article, the all of the links and everything she pulled isn't anything that fans haven't already talked about yeah. online. Like all of this is stuff fans have talked about online. The difference is that 
it's coming with the weight of a very prestigious publication. Yeah. And like we talked about this before when we talked about C.T. Jones for Rolling Stone wrote an article about like the Gaylor theory and like the article that they wrote was like a good article and it very much was kind of like in a similar vein to what we do here, which is reporting on things that other people are doing and kind of like navigating it and narrating it really. And so it's not so much that like CT was in the wrong for doing that. It was more so like, why was there not thought from like anybody at Rolling Stone of like, reporting on this and writing about it and like interviewing people who are part of like the Gaylor theory is like giving more weight to it. And this is in similar vein with Anna Marx's op-ed of it's like when media literacy is at an all time low and then fans go and they see this like specifically like Gaylor fans see that the New York Times published this, it's going to be like, oh, wow, the New York Times is giving their stamp of approval to this being said. Therefore, they must know something. Because I just like think about like when we did our Larry Stylinson episode and like the whole Tin Hatter thing and like conspiracy theorists and like all of those sorts of things where we've talked before about how you can both be like, yeah, I love the idea of Gaylor, but I understand that that's not her life. But there's also the side of like, I love Gaylor and I deeply know that Taylor is gay and I will do anything to help her figure out how to tell everybody that she is. And like right now, what Taylor's life is to all of us is the other side of that equation of I want this to be true. And it like gives me solace to believe in Gaylor. But I also understand that Taylor's living her life and I'm going to let her live that. And it's like, right, that's fine. But the other side of it is causing issues I just can't imagine again like I just like to bring this to like a real life situation where it's like imagine being in a friend group and you find out one day that like a subsection of like this friend group the whole time has been like she's so fucking gay and they like talk about it all the time no matter how many boyfriends of yours that they meet or how much you talk about like all the guys you have crushes on and they just are always like no, like everything she says is so fucking queer. Like she, she's just in denial. Like imagine your friends were talking about you like this. Like that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that's so insane. And it's like, I'm just thinking if like Taylor is as straight as she is coming across right now, it is so possible that all of this like gay history iconography that Anna Marks and like other Gaylers are claiming that Taylor is putting in her music. Taylor might be so far removed from that, that she's just like, no, I just like love the color lavender and like doing my frilly little dance. I mean, and thinking of the conversation we just had with Billie Eilish, it's possible that like some percentage of Taylor is not straight. Yeah. But she hasn't gotten that far on her own personal journey. Like it's possible that like some of the iconography is real But it's like subconsciously she's drawn to certain things that she's not really broached the subject with herself. Like that's also like a third option that's possible. Well, because Anna Anna mentions like comp pet in this story. But I think like the Carly Kloss of it all is I think like the most believable Gaylor theory out of all of it in regards to like them having like a little a little thing, a little fling at some point. And so I think it's just like if Taylor had like if Taylor is bisexual, if Taylor has had these moments, like I just think that like Taylor being like the queen of Easter eggs is going to be her downfall because fans are expecting that she is going to tell them this through song or through like hidden little gems and things. And it's like, why is she not allowed to like have that potential bisexual part of her be something that's just for her? I think that that's completely fine. Like, I understand the need for representation, but, like, when we have so many at this point, like, out queer artists, like, why do we need it in Taylor when she is willingly allowing you to interpret her music however you want? Like, at no point has Taylor been like, stop interpreting my music to be gay. Like, she's not said that. There's, like, so many things that Taylor has put her foot down about, and that is not one of them. And I'm not saying she's not putting her foot down because her music is gay, I'm just saying that like she understands what art is and like wants her fans to interpret the art how they see fit. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with all that. And I do think the Easter egg thing (laughs) really maybe Taylor's downfall eventually. I mean, not not like downfall in that regard, just like 
fans are always going to come back to the fact that Taylor's known to put Easter eggs in her music yeah. and like expect that as a treat and a reward for doing all this theorizing. But this New York Times article did have backlash in general for being written for the New York Times publishing it. And we have an article in CNN by Oliver Darcy in which he talked to a person close to the situation who requested to remain anonymous, who said, because of her massive success and this moment, there is a tailor shaped hole in people's ethics, which like, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to agree with that. I mean, maybe, maybe in the sense of the, the time person of the year article in which the journalists would not question Taylor's narrative. Maybe that's the Taylor shaped hole in people's ethics. And then goes on to say this article wouldn't have been written about Sean Mendez or any male artist who sexually has been questioned. So it literally was written, it literally just, was written about hairstyles just, by the same author. I just think it's so funny because like <laughs> a source close to the situation, it's usually Tree Payne or like somebody that like actually works with Taylor. And so all I can think about is like Taylor got so mad about Sean Mendez's lie detector test where he said that Joe Alwyn was <laughs> evil. <laughs> she was like, drop that twink's name, drop it. <laughs> It's like you could have just said Harry, the same writer. But I guess yeah. also like they wouldn't say Harry because then it's like tying Taylor and Harry back together again. Yeah, like they um, can't do that. But still, just say male artist. <laughs> <laughs> you just pick one. Yeah, but so anyways, that is factually incorrect. And then it says there seems to be no boundary some journalists won't cross when writing about Taylor, which again, I think just applies to most celebrities. Like whoever the source was, was really trying to make Taylor to be the victim. Once again, I think like you could apply these statements to most celebrities. Yeah. Goes on to say, regardless of how invasive, untrue and appropriate it is all under the protective veil of an opinion piece. So clearly whoever the source was close to Taylor was also mad about this op-ed. This is the closest we've ever gotten to like someone dismissing allegations though if it was tree pain yeah being like how dare you speculate like what does that mean for fans well like this is the thing it's like fans speculating and talking online is so different than a publication publishing something and i think like publicists and all these people have to be aware of like the lack of media literacy that have been going on. I mean, it got the lack of media literacy in America got Donald Trump elected president. Like, let's be fucking for real, you know? We're in dire straits here, like when it comes. I know, but also like literacy. Taylor, like people like alleging Taylor to be gay is like not that harmful. Well, I think like again, when especially looking at the time person of the year interview, Taylor loves to be in control of her narrative. Yeah. And she doesn't do interviews that often for a reason like she doesn't want to be written about in certain ways and it's like even when you read the stories about like her relationship or anything like that like there were those stories about like at her birthday she was wearing that like opal ring and opal is travis kelsey's birthstone and so everybody's like, oh, my God, Travis Kelsey, like, gave her a ring with his birthstone. And then Kelly Teller fucking went on Instagram and was like, look at this beautiful ring I bought my friend. So, like, Taylor is controlling the narrative through her friends by her friends correcting the narrative, like, on social media. You know, like, that's how much. And, and like, and, <laughs> I told you, Kelly Teller is going to tell us some shit. <laughs> but She's going to tell Kelly Teller is going to tell all. <laughs> but it's like I, there have been so many instances recently, especially with how much she's been written about lately, where the articles are never anywhere near as speculative as they are when it comes to other celebrities or other narratives that we have seen online. And so I think it's like very clear to everyone. It's like you stay in Taylor's good books or you never get access to Taylor Swift or anywhere she's ever going to be ever again. Like she, and like, it's, it's like kind of scary and like very 1985 y of like how in control of like the media narrative Taylor is. Right. And so I like understand like when these rumors about her have been like following her forever like why they would want to shut down an op-ed from the New York Times. Like they're not going to shut down fan rumors or like fans talking about stuff. But in the same regard of like her, even in like the 1989 Taylor's version liner notes being like, oh, like everybody was always speculating about my relationships. Like Taylor's always been like this when it comes to these things. She hates speculation. She hates when people talk about her in a way that she didn't authorize them to talk about her. 
So like this makes sense. I mean, that I forgot. I forgot about the liner notes and when she shut down, <laughs> she shut down Gaylor in her liner notes. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's just like she keeps doing these things and she's like, if you're not going to listen to me here, then you'll listen to me like um, on this place or whatever. Taylor Swift can never wear a color again. (laughs) Like, yeah, it's like in the grand scheme of things, this op-ed isn't that big of a deal. But like to Taylor and like her perfectly perfectly manicured narrative, it is that big of a deal. Yeah. So I don't know. It's like, it's, it's a very complicated thing. <laughs> I just like Taylor, why can't you care about your perfectly manicured image when in the end of the music video for you need to calm down said, let's show our pride by demanding that on a national level, our laws truly treat all our citizens equally. Meanwhile, this e- last year when all the anti-trans bills were trying to be passed, she was absolutely silenced. But <laughs> I mean, Taylor has been and I think will continue to be somebody who only talks about things when it benefits her and that's the hill i'm gonna die on because like she's never proven to be anything other than a white feminist so but that's a whole other story that's a whole other that's conversation a whole other but i just thought i'd bring no i mean i think i think i think it's i think it's completely (laughs) relevant to the conversation but yeah i mean i don't know i just think that like sometimes sometimes you have inside thoughts and i feel like half of this article was an inside thought like it didn't need to be (laughs) Like, I just think that she could have written a really interesting op-ed about, like, iconography and music and, like, why it's so important and relevant to, like, be able to, like, interpret music in a way that means something to you and, like, how that can, like, shift conversation and, like, all of this sort of stuff. Like, I think that that's so relevant and important to talk about. And instead, she, like, tarnished that idea with being, like, look at all of this proof that Taylor is gay. Right, right. And it's, like, Why? Like, why do we I need to this proof? So yeah, this turned to be the gayest episode ever. <laughs> Which I was like looking at our episodes of like early 2023 and they were all gay stuff too. Because I guess there was no- nothing else was going on in the media except being not gay. Yeah, I feel like the start of the year is like when people are having their thoughts because nothing's happening yet. And it's like award show season and everybody's making speculations of who's going to show up on the carpet with who. So... Who knows? Not me. Anyway, <laughs> we talked about a lot today. It was it was good to be back. It was good to like work my brain like this again. I deeply miss having these conversations. So if you guys had any thoughts or feelings about this episode, we would love to hear from you, especially about this op-ed, because I know a lot of y'all are big Taylor fans, so I'm sure you have thoughts and feelings. You can find us on social media. We are at Name Free Songs. We are always available to chat. If you have any grievances, beef, or love, you would like to send either of our way. I'm at Sarah underscore Fagan on all platforms, and Jenna is at Jenna underscore Million. So thanks for joining us this week on Name Three Songs. And until next time, never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band. And remember, you're never too cool to ship Timmy and Kylie. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review. They really help. If you want to find out more about any of the sources we referenced in this episode, you can visit name3songs.com. 